So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak in this uh, splendid uh, setting and also uh, address so many experts in the field. Uh, I have to say that's quite a challenge for a stroke researcher, especially to talk after John um, and, and the expertise that is in the room. So um, I'll try um, to do my best and tell you a little bit about best and also bad practice, I guess, in meta research and um, some ideas for future directions because I, I guess uh, there's a group of people who think whether they should continue in this field. So let me start by just giving you three reasons and I think there are many more why uh, preclinical research needs meta. Um, the one and, and I think in many of the things that I'm uh, going to uh, talk about I, I can be very brief because not only are you your experts, uh, it's also that uh, John provided, I think, uh, uh, all the uh, background for it. So I think one reason is that there is quite uh, some uh, irreproducibility in preclinical research, and that's something we have uh, heard first from the industry. They were kind of the whistleblowers, uh, and um, that was anecdotal, and, and there are some of those papers can be, I think, uh, fairly criticized. But now we have systematic uh, uh, evidence from, from, for example, reproducibility projects like cancer biology, and it's quite clear that we, we have a problem. Um, another reason, I think, um, and that's uh, on a much larger scale, is the problem of uh, taking uh, basic research results to, to our patients uh, and eventually uh, do something good with it, have new drugs, new therapies, new diagnostics, and so forth. We all know that this is a, a, a protracted process and, and it has many gaps and, and there may be many reasons why we are so, uh, where there's so little success and so much attrition in this process, but there is a suspicion and, and I, as a stroke researcher I can tell you I, I share this suspicion, um, that actually a lot of this uh, attrition has to do with the quality of, of research in, on, on the preclinical side, so we're building on stuff that, that is not robust, not rigorous and, and then why would we expect that it uh, um, uh, helps us to, to devise new therapies for humans? And there's a third reason, and that is um, that in the, in the clinical realm, there's a lot of regulation. I mean, there's good clinical practice, there's the FDA and so forth. In this preclinical realm, there is practically no regulation. I'm, I'm not asking for regulation here, but I'm, it's just the fact that, that basically you can do anything uh, and then write a paper on it, and no one knows really what, what you did. So, so there's no accountability because there are no, there's no regulation and there's no monitoring for it. Uh, some argue that there's GLP, good laboratory practice, but that's completely different. It's about, I mean, mixing reagents uh, the proper way. It's not about um, uh, controlling biases and stuff like that. So it's, it's an unregulated area, and it's worthwhile to, uh, to do research on, on, on how this research is done. Now, let me uh, walk you through a, a few things which I think there's already a lot of good practice or best practice in terms of meta-research and, and I'm sure uh, there, there's, there's not really much new that I can provide for you, but just it's, it's, uh, we're, we're all um, collecting these things. So um, I think uh, in terms of systematic reviews, uh, that's uh, something that is uh, highly useful. Um, and sort of a, a, a personal anecdote to this is my, I had my coming out in, in, in my suspicions that I think that there's something going wrong in my field, experimental stroke research. Uh, when I wrote this article that was in, I wrote it I guess in 2005 and, and it was published in 2006 and it was, a, it was labeled as a review article and when I submitted it, one of the reviewers was Malcolm McLeod and he, he, he said, well, this is all nice but but it's a narrative review. Why don't you do something quantitative about it? Why don't you do a meta-analysis? And I thought, this idiot, I mean, now the, I have it here, and why, why, don't, why don't you, uh, I mean, uh, accept that as, as a narrative review? In fact, he accepted it, and he made very important points. But I, I didn't grasp his, his uh, point fully, I have, I have to admit. Um, now, I mean, I still do narrative reviews kind of thing, but I don't label them as reviews, actually. I, I, this is, uh, uh, it, it's what we do in narrative reviews are, are opinion pieces. Um, and so, and that, I think that's, it's fair if we label it at that, and this can drive fields and, and, and we can provide ideas to others. 
and, and then get criticized for it or, or others follow us. But, but we should not really call them reviews unless they are systematic. Um, and in fact, I would go as um, far as, as saying that uh, I think every preclinical project should, should start with a systematic review. Maybe not in the in a sort of a full-blown systematic review, uh, which then would be published, would obviously would be nice, but, but to have a systematic review of what's out there. And uh, I can tell you that this is, um, you probably know that, but this is not normally the case. And so uh, at the Quest Center in Berlin, if we, uh, sometimes we have, um, uh, we counsel our, our medical school when they come out with programs, um, we have now established uh, 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 that they ask uh, specifically uh, and also in preclinical projects that uh, the, the evidence uh, that is the basis for the project is systematically reviewed and that the criteria are laid out open and so forth. And I think that should be uh, uh, also the case. In some, some funders, I think, do that. But in Germany, for example, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, I can tell you, they don't care. In fact, they would be confused even if you do that. Um, the problem here, obviously, is that in preclinical, uh, systematic reviews are practically unknown, or I mean, they're getting uh, better now, now, but most basic researchers or preclinical researchers don't know what it is, what it could do for them, and how they could do it. So we need to tell them how to do it. We need to teach the, the techniques. And um, uh, so also at the Quest Center, we have, uh, and that's uh, done by, by uh, Sarah McCann, um, we, we offer training in, in systematic reviews with a specific focus on preclinical. Now, uh, the quantitative uh, fashion, of course, of a systematic review would be a meta-analysis, and I think there has been some uh, quite good practice in, in the field. Um, uh, and in fact, the, I would say the uh, absolute um, pioneer in this is Malcolm McLeod, uh, pictured here. Uh, it's not that he's marrying uh, Emily. Um, Emily got married. Uh, she's also a uh, well-known figure in the field. Uh, she just got married, and uh, Malcolm was the best man. So um, this is from, uh, they, they had, I think, uh, quite a number of, of uh, very influential uh, meta-analysis, in spe especially in, in, in the stroke field. This is just one of them. Um, and it, it collects evidence that basically in, in preclinical stroke research, if you look in the literature, um, everything, every, uh, it doesn't matter what you treat your mice, rats, whatever you're using with, it will reduce infarct sizes by about 30% with an extremely large, uh, extremely small error margin. Which, which would give us a lot of hope for, for what we do clinically, but I can tell you none of this has translated clinically, um, and everything seems to work. So, so this is kind of, it doesn't tell us why this is. Uh, it, this could be all right, and, and this is perfect, and there's something uh, problematic in going from mouse to man, but it also could tell us, uh, and that I, I would uh, uh, second this, is that there's a problem in this type of research that comes up with only positive results. Um, but uh, meta-analysis in the preclinical realm can take you even further. You can try to tease out where, where problems are. And that's another um, uh, meta-analysis that comes from, from Malcolm's um, group. Um, and here he was looking at internal validity, uh, methods to control bias specifically in various preclinical uh, models. Um, and um, each bar represents a, a different model. Most of them are neuroscience, but there's also myocardial infarction in it. And, and so by, by this meta-analysis, they were able to show that in, in preclinical uh, methods to control bias, like randomization, blinding, uh, conflicts of interest statements, and so are, are exceedingly rare. I mean, well, if you consider 30% uh, okay, but it's, it's roughly around 30%, and it has not changed uh, much since uh, this review came out um, in 2015. So, so this is already getting us a little bit closer to causation. I mean, uh, but we could even get closer to causation. Uh, well, before, well, I should say, show that before. I think we get a little bit further uh, in terms of causation if we then can show, and that's from, from another, uh, meta-analysis that not controlling for biases actually changes uh, the results. That's from a, uh, a study where we were looking at uh, a compound NXY 
um, in experimental models. And in fact, the reason why we did this is because this was a drug. This was a drug where there were huge hopes, and uh, the the company uh, uh, AstraZeneca, they, their shares went up. Um, and there was the largest neuroprotection trial ever in stroke using this drug, and it was a complete null. I mean, it, 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 the, the, there was no benefit of the drug whatsoever, but there was quite a lot of preclinical evidence in different models uh, that suggested that there might be an effect. So um, we were able to show that uh, depending on whether, for example, there was blinding of uh, outcome um, or blinding of conduct of the experiment, those who did it, those studies who did it, had about uh, half the effect sizes that, than those that uh, did not control for that particular bias. And so this is just an example that this can take you, I think, pretty close to the sources of, of, of problems. Another one that you obviously are also very uh, well known is the problem of publication bias that we have so that only the, the good stuff is published. This is very prevalent in, in preclinical. Um, can be shown by meta-analysis. Uh, uh, you're the experts on whether funnel plotting is the most uh, um, methodologically appropriate way of doing it. Um, but just by, for example, reading that only 10 publications out of 525 uh, reported a, a, a non-significant effect is already a very strong indication that something's going on uh, that is, uh, that there must be something out there which, which is not as positive. So uh, I think another best practice of meta-research in the preclinical field uh, comes from simulations. Um, and this is just an example. There, there's a lot of other stuff that's uh, own stuff uh, that uh, we did where we were looking at attrition bias. And um, so we were essentially asking the question, um, it, are all the animals uh, that go into a preclinical study um, reported? Um, and that we did by, by analyzing whether uh, the, the numbers add up. Uh, so between the graphs and the tables where the reports uh, are, are where, where the results are reported and, and what went into the study. Our first shock obviously was that uh, in, in about 70% and that stroke and cancer, it was not possible to even answer the question because they didn't tell us how many uh, animals went into the study. It's like reading a, a clinical trial where they give you a result but they don't tell you how many, uh, how many uh, were enrolled in the study. So 70 percent. Um, some of them um, matched and, and some of them had a, um, an attrition and there was explained attrition and so forth. But um, the, what I want to show you here is that we then, um, based on, on the uh, variance that is in those studies, uh, that is normally reported, and the number of animals, which is on average eight per group in, in both fields. Um, you can do um, simple simulations by just uh, simulating null results, which we never know. I mean, if we go into our own, we, we, we never know whether the, the drug acts or not. I mean, so, so simulation is a, is a very nice way of looking into, uh, into that matter. And so we were simulating these uh, null results and, and showed that uh, with, with such a small number of animals and the variance that these studies have, if you just take out one animal um, on either side, uh, on either extreme, you get a 30% and a statistically significant effect. This is not, now we don't know whether this is what these studies did, but on the other hand, it's, it's actually quite uh, suggestive that you can get this, these famous 30% uh, infarct volume reduction by simply taking out one animal on, uh, in a directed fashion. And there are always reasons why uh, you might say, well, this is such a huge infarct, I mean, I had a bad day, or the animal ran away. Or, I mean, there are all kinds of reasons why, why uh, you can do stuff like that. So um, that, I think, is, uh, is where simulation can help us a lot. Um, and there are sm uh, even smarter ways, or there are ways that are really friendly to the reader. We can provide shiny apps where then uh, authors of our papers can play with their own numbers and see how this would affect um, their own data. This is just another example. Now, um, another good example from, for meta-research in, in the preclinical realm um, are interventions. They, they are rare, but, but they are out there, and, and I think they're very helpful. Just to give you one example. Um, again, from, from Malcolm's uh, group, um, and that was a randomized control trial um, trying to answer the question whether it is helpful in the preclinical realm to have 
checklists for authors um, whether they use the so-called ARRIVE guidelines. These are guidelines, um, reporting guidelines for animal uh, experiments, uh, very similar as, for example, the consort statement for, for uh, the um, uh, clinical world. And so they did a randomized uh, trial. They, they randomized uh, two groups. One were, were, the, were the referees and the authors and the editors um, were using such a check sheet and, and another group where they didn't. And then the question was, did th does this change practice? So they were just looking at the papers that were then published. Did this change practice? And um, the sad news in this particular case, it didn't make a difference whether they um, uh, whether these uh, checklists were around or not. Now, um, I, I have a strong urge to also talk about bad practice in, 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 in meta-research in, uh, in preclinical. And uh, there's, a, there's a real problem here, and that's uh, the basic uh, sort of uh, issue here is garbage in, garbage out. Um, so there, is, there are now many meta-analyses out there that are uh, uh, synthesizing effect sizes in, in the field uh, with the intent not to show that, like, like this earlier study that I showed you, there must be something fishy if they all work and if they all have the same effect size, but rather to make decisions about uh, whether to take a drug from, from the preclinical to the clinical realm. Why am I saying that this is a problem? Um, Internal validity is extremely low in these fields. We know it through meta-research, randomization, blinding, pre-specified inclusion, exclusion criteria, all those things are problematic. Power is extremely low. Uh, sample sizes are around eight. Uh, we don't have replications. We don't have confirmation. Um, uh, there's the garden of the forking path. I will touch uh, on this in a second. Um, uh, usually, the, these papers are, are about multiple lines of evidence, um, and they have no primary, no secondary endpoints. There's no pre-registration, and uh, thus a very high degree of experimental freedom. Just to reiterate a few of those things, I mean, one is sample size. Sample sizes are exceedingly low. Um, statistical power to detect even, let's say, even large effects uh, of D equal one or so are, is, is low. Um, usually less than 50% on average, and uh, through, through the, uh, the work of, of John, who was the first who, I think, pointed his finger into this wound, we know that this leads to a huge uh, uh, false positive rate. And uh, what is also important, and that is important, I think, for the, for the meta-research uh, community, is that this produces a, a dramatic overestimation of uh, effect sizes, which you then uh, Synthesize in those uh, in those studies. There's a very nice paper by David Colcoon with with R code uh, in in and and an app uh, in uh, in the supplement where one can play with it. But basically, what it shows is that if if you work at the power that is uh, average in those fields, like b just below 50 percent, even if there are true effects, you get overestimation of almost 50 percent which you then accumulate in, uh, or aggregate in those uh, syntheses. Then there's the Garden of the Forking Paths. I guess most of you know what this is. Uh, it's, uh, it's based on, a, uh, on, on Borges' uh, um, novel, of course, um, but uh, a very nice paper by, by Gelman and Logan. And, and so, so bas basically the idea is, and this is the world of preclinical research, is that we are wandering through kind of a maze of, of, of potential things we can do and things we actually do. And then uh, some, something works, something doesn't work, and so we are wandering through this thing, and at the end of it, there may be a paper, or in fact there is always a paper that comes out of it, and that appears to be the result of kind of a linear progression through, through a series of experiments that were conceived somewhere in the morning under the shower where you had this, this brilliant idea. But, but there are hundreds of other possibilities that you could have taken and you didn't, or which you actually did, but then you didn't report. And so this is one reason why in, in this particular type of, of work, which is, is exploration, uh, um, it, 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 there's very arguable where you, whether you should do test statistics at all, because you would have to factor in all the studies that you have done and that didn't work out, but you also, and that's, that's impossible, you, you would have to factor in all the studies that you didn't do, you could have done, but you didn't do. So, 
Um, that's a, that's a, a big issue and a, an interesting topic in itself. But in principle, this is the problem of if you aggregate in a, in a meta-analysis the results of such studies, um, it, it is a real problem. It could be solved by pre-registration or registration, and, and I'm, I'm with John that there, there needs to be a, 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 a field or an area where we do not pre-register, but we have to label it, and we have to say this is pure discovery, this is pure, uh, um, this is pure exploration, this is actually what we do in our lab now. Every paper that we publish now that is exploration has exploration in the title. This is an exploratory study, study colon, on, whatever. Um, but this is not the norm. But uh, I think uh, pre-registration or even registered reports could um, help here, especially if we then base this, uh, these results are, uh, use these results as, on the, as the basis of systematic reviews or, pre or uh, meta-analysis. And so I think the, the, the underlying theme or, or problem here is that we do not normally discriminate between exploration and, and uh, uh, and confirmation, and uh, we are not using the power of these two um, uh, uh, modes of, of, uh, of research. Um, in fact, the problem is that they are confounded. So the most, most papers that you read in the preclinical realm um, appear to be confirmatory because they give you a, uh, they, they confirm, they say we have shown this and that to be a, um, a transcription factor, this a drug that works. And this is where they, th we had this, this hypothesis in the beginning, but in, in, well, it's not true. You cannot come up with a hypothesis uh, uh, and, and, and demonstrate it's, it's, uh, that it's true in the same experiment. But this is what, what people normally do, and we should um, um, obviously um, kind of um, discriminate. So, junk in, junk out, there are, uh, uh, there's an increasing number of meta-analyses now, this is just uh, one uh, uh, that I picked almost at random, that show, this is Ginkgo lit B for myocardial ischemia reperfusion injury. It, it uses a perfectly valid um, methodology in terms of doing a meta-research, but the result is complete bogus. It comes up with uh, tremendous effects for this, for this Ginkgo lead. But, but the basis for, for the, the studies that were aggregated here are just not fit to be aggregated. So this type of, of meta-analysis we don't need. So just a few ideas for future directions, and obviously this is not very original, but just to bring it up. Um, one, and, and that's something that Tracy Weisgerber at Quest is now, I think, pursuing, is uh, to think about systematic evidence synthesis for complex claims. I mean, I mentioned uh, the, this, this triangulation that we normally do in our exploration. So uh, there's a Western blot here, and there's an animal uh, result with a specific outcome of the model that we are using, and, uh, and then there's a gene sequence, whatever. So it's, and, and then we, we, we build it together, and it's almost like a picture, like an image. And this is, uh, our, these are our results. So, this is, the, this is a hard nut to crack, cr to crack and, uh, in terms of, of evidence synthesis, and maybe it's not even possible, but it might be possible. There may be uh, smart ways of, of uh, even synthesizing such complex claims. This is actually not only obviously uh, pertaining to preclinical, but, but here it's obvious that a lot of the research we do is, is uh, there, and we, we are completely uh, lacking approaches to this. Another one, obviously, are interventions. Um, I mentioned a few, but it's rather rare. And, and the um, sort of the, the blue flower, or um, what we would really uh, would like to see is, is to provide evidence for the efficacy of those uh, approaches that we are talking all the time. Um, and uh, that's the hard thing, obviously. Um, it's very hard to randomize uh, um, bad practice and good practice, and so, um, also, the, 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 the tapestry is changing while we do this. There are lots of changes uh, that, that's, uh, that are occurring in, in, in um, specific fields. Uh, we read about those things. So it's very hard to show efficacy of those measures, and it may even be not necessary to show it for some of them because they are so obvious in terms of uh, bias prevention and so forth. But nevertheless, we are always 
ask about, well, does it pay off to do these things? This is very resource intense, what you're asking about. So uh, can, you, can you prove that this is actually doing any good? Um, and finally, and that's something that uh, Daniel Strech, also at Quest, is now um, really looking into, um, is, the, is, is kind of a, 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 a good justification practice. Um, uh, the background of this is there's very insufficient vetting of, of preclinical evidence and, and, and w w why and, and when it's taken into clinical development. Um, he, he just recently did a study where he took investigator brochures, and that's the basis for regulators and also for ethics committees for IRBs to decide whether they uh, give a go to certain studies. And he was looking at these investigator brochures asking about uh, whether uh, one can find um, uh, measures of uh, uh, some indication of the quality of the preclinical pre evidence or of the efficacy of the preclinical evidence and the, the simple answer is no. Um, so um, these, these decisions are, are, are done on a, uh, not taking into account actually what, what's, what's been done uh, preclinically. Um, and so maybe um, this could, and, and that I think also um, a little bit uh, relates to the Theranos case, I mean, we need, we need ways of vetting uh, these various evidences that we have for for things that we then take to patients. And now, this, at this point, this is done in a completely irrational way. I mean, there are lots of interests in companies and with some researchers and, and startups. Who start, I mean, so um, is there a way, uh, in, a, in a systematic way, uh, to, to justify uh, or not to justify, to, to go on uh, with a certain development, to even have some quantitative indicators for this? Uh, I, I cannot show you how, should, how this should be done, but it's, it's, I, think, I think it's a worthwhile uh, idea to think about those things. Um, this, I think, also, and that's something that did not really uh, feature so far, must in, now include external uh, and construct validity. Um, in the stroke field, just as an example, we work with, with male uh, C56 black, these are inbred mice, they are three mon one to three months old, um, and they live under so-called SPF, specific pathogen-free conditions. If you, if you try to extrapolate this to a, to a human cohort, you would probably end up with healthy pubertal male twins, they're all uh, genetically identical, uh, and, and we raise them in a six square meter incubator and feed them with granola all day. And that's, th this is what the research is based on, and this is where we then uh, make inference about whether we should take this or that drug or principle to the patient, and obviously in stroke, um, the cohort looks quite different. So this, in, in, in this uh, good justification practice, this should be taken into account. Maybe it's interesting to find a certain mechanism in this young inbred mice, but well, uh, it, it, may not, uh, it may be not relevant for, for a completely different cohort here. Yeah? So um, that, that was just, um, that's kind of my summary, I think. There is a lot of good uh, uh, practice, and, and we should really take this further in, in preclinical meta research. Um, there is, we're, I think we're, we're, we're seeing uh, something, we're just at the beginning of seeing a big problem, and that's too much bad meta analyses um, in, 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 in the field. It's kind of skyrocketing. Um, bad in the sense not that the methodology is faulty, but rather that the basis of, uh, of those, uh, what, what, what it synthesizes is, is, is not fit for being synthesized. And I think um, the, the meta-research in, 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 in preclinical, there's, there's lots of stuff to do for those of you who are doing a PhD here or already have, uh, uh, graduated from, from, from Mirror. I think um, there's lots of stuff for you to do. Um, finally, I should um, invite you all. Um, we have, uh, uh, we're hosting in, in Berlin uh, in February next year a, a Reward Equator conference, which is very much about also the themes that, that uh, are, are discussed uh, today. So this is about sharing strategies for research improvement. Unfortunately, the deadline for abstract submission has uh, just passed, but um, um, come and discuss with us uh, in Berlin next year. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ulrich. Uh, Some questions? Perhaps I, I could start then. Um, do you think the researchers in this field are prone to change? Because my experience was that they were quite sort of reluctant, thinking that, uh, well, you're going to reduce innovation if you do a protocol. Uh, doing blinding is expensive. Mm. Uh, doing randomization has no sense because uh, uh, all the mice and all the rats are similar because yeah. they are genetically modified. So what is your impression? It's a, big, it's a big problem and I have to say it's a problem for those researchers indeed because if you uh, abide by those things that we are uh, uh, singling out as uh, uh, what should be improved, like what you said, uh, larger sample sizes, larger uh, uh, control of bias and so forth, um, the truth is that you will not produce as many spectacular papers, not as many uh, uh, papers at all, but also many of your papers will not uh, claim that they have found a new drug or a new mechanism and so forth, and will not consequently uh, be published at such a high level, uh, at, a, at a high impact journal. And so if we talk about this problem, we need to talk about incentives, because this is what drives these researchers, uh, is, is uh, it's not so much the new mechanism, it's more the, the nature paper which you get to a new mechanism. So, if, so, so the, I, to me the, the key uh, to this is that there is a, there is a portion, I have to say, there, there is a, uh, there's a fraction of researchers and it may not be even a small one, especially under, among the younger ones. I'm not sure, 10%, 20% or so. They are really uh, amenable to the discussion that we're having here without the, 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 the incentive thing. They, they just don't, they understand that they are wasting their time. But, but this is unfortunately a smaller portion. And to get the other portion, we need to change the incentives. There's no, no that's the only thing I, I can think of. That's right. Uh, we'll start here and then you. Hi, hi, it's Andrew Freeman from GSK. Um, uh, you talked about a lot of the preclinical studies not being as robust perhaps as they should be. And we've also discussed in the previous presentation around data sharing. Have you got any thoughts how data sharing could actually work in the preclinical area, particularly if some of those exper experiments are not as good as perhaps they should be? Are we then perpetuating use of those data and they're fundamentally flawed? Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's, a <laughs> that's a valid concern. So, so if you share bad stuff, <laughs> <laughs> is not not a good idea. So it must go hand in hand. So we should share only data that has, has certain quality standards. That brings in a whole other discussion about increasing quality standards in this type of research, making sure uh, that not only do we have the standards, but they are also upheld. And, 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 and this, is, so this is a big discussion. And also, is it useful to aggregate eight animals uh, altogether? Um, so uh, these are, that, that's the problem side. The positive side of, of this sharing in preclinical is that it, I think, increases external validity of this data. Because if you have a lot of, even if you have these huge studies, let's say even at, at a company, you, you do a, and you have, a, I don't know, a, a, an outside company doing it for you, they do 300 mice, beautiful. Now you have your 300 mice, but they are done in this particular laboratory, uh, FIFA service, whatever. Even let's say under perfect conditions and, and with by very high quality standards, but, but the external validity of such data is rather low. So I think there's, a, there's an extra, a super extra gain uh, by, by combining uh, this sort of data if it's of good quality um, and, and that's something also that I think is a big challenge to annotate it appropriately in, in, in this, it's not like in clinical where you just have a few, um, just uh, where you can come up with common data elements and so forth that are pretty straightforward. In preclinical, it's a mess. It's very hard to come up with this. So what I think it needs, it, this needs groups of researchers that work together in certain fields who know that these are the, the relevant outcomes and so forth. So this, this needs to be field specific, I think, this sharing. Very quick, uh, very nice talk. Um, we will be there in the debate, at the end of the day, we will go back to, say, the incentive and rewards, but this is also about quality control. So when I was very young, Uli, and did my research in, uh, in, in the blood transfusion service, before we submitted the paper, uh, we had to show our data and our paper to 
department heads of other departments, not your own, and they had to sign off before, and you had to discuss your data with those persons, which was very scary for a young PhD, I can tell you, uh, even for me. Uh, and uh, so the discussion was, because I have a loud mouth, and so, uh, and so we, we're blaming the journals and we're blaming everybody mm. that, that people are not sticking to quality control, etc. But in the end, of course, yeah. and Phil Campbell, when he was still Nature uh, editor, said to me in a, in, a, in a discussion in Berlin, you guys, I was the dean of a medical center, mm. You guys are sending us all this rubbish. Yeah. And so, and it's, of course, I think we have to really think how institutions yeah. can play there and how also institutions yeah. can have their quality yeah. mark. That yeah. if you are at Stanford, just yeah. a, an example of a university, that if something comes from that institution, it has an internal quality mark and, it, and those yeah. people, they only submit things which are really good. And they have done their own internal peer review, more or less which used to be pretty normal in the, uh, yeah. say, 70s and 80s, more or less. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I will argue for that. And there's also a paper in Nature now who's arguing for that in a li yeah. little bit of a different way. Yeah, you probably integrity. saw that. But yeah. I, think, I'm, I think we yeah. should really think that there's also responsibility for institutions. Yeah. Uh, I agree, but I, I, I would like to just add one uh, thing that goes even further into the research groups themselves. I think uh, it's not fair to blame preclinical research for being non-robust. I think there are lots of groups who are very robust and do very good work. Um, and it, a lot of them, I, if, I, if, I, if I think about a structure, how are they different from other groups? I think critical factors are that they are not too big, that they have a certain size, but that they're not too big, that they have a laboratory head who knows what he or she is doing and who's present and who runs a kind of a, a culture where, where these results are discussed and so forth. Unfortunately, and particularly in biomedicine, this is not the rule. And this is partially because in biomedicine we have a lot of researchers who are uh, doing many things. They, they, they are in the clinics, they, they, they have to teach. They, they, so, so there's so much, and then we're maybe also back with incentives and structures, but it's very hard for them to, to have a, a controlled environment. And so they have lots of people who do lots of stuff and they are just rewarded in these small groups for coming up with, with excellent data. You, what you just said would at least partially take care of that because you would not get the stamp from the institution. Um, but I think it, it needs also, it really needs a strong focus on, on, on the group level and good group structures. There's a, there's a lot about social control. Yes. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, well, I would like to thank you very much for this great talk and uh, 